Sing, we come in here, we sing these songs about being gone and being free. And I just cried. We sing a song, you know I'm horrible with lyrics. What was the one song we sang a little bit ago about, <laughs> about worship? What was that? Israel is like a mashup with Israel New Breed on there. What, what is that? Well, there we go. Can, I do, can we do that song? Okay. Presence is heaven, Sean. Just we're gonna flip the script for a second. I know, I'm messing things up. I gotta hurry up anyways. I'm over there in the corner I don't even know the lyrics. Someone got to put up the lyrics for me. But it talks about our worship. And our worship is more than just your voice. Your worship is just more than just your hands raised. Your worship is your life. And we're, what is the word? What is the lyric about the worship? Becca, I need help. To worship you, I live. Thank you so much. My goodness. Isn't, the, isn't that the name of the song, I think? I'm a drummer. I was a drummer. And we're singing that song, to worship you I live, to worship. Do you understand what you're saying? Um, to worship you I live. In other words, the reason for my life, the reason for my existence is to worship you. To worship you, that's why I live. The reason why I'm breathing today Life has thrown me a ton of curveballs, but I got up and I got to church because my existence hinges on my worship. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. I'm alive today. And my worship is just more than my hands. It's my falling on my face when it's just me and my dog in a basement and nobody is around. And I'm crying and I'm saying, God, use me and I don't care what they say I, I don't care what they think to worship you I live and I worship you more than not just my mouth and not just my hands and not just my tithe and my offering I know we put a lot of emphasis but just my life and I sit over there and I cry because I think no matter where you take me no matter where you lead me no matter my adversity, no matter what comes my way, I want to worship you. I want to worship you with my life. Uh, uh, I don't cry. I don't cry like this. I don't even know how to. I worship you. It's strange because I think a lot of people, I think everybody could kind of say this, that God just kind of uses your life in crazy ways, but I feel like the position I'm in, I feel like a lot of strange things just always happen to me. People that say, I've got your back, but where are they at now? I said this a couple weeks ago, everybody's your fan. Yeah, thank you. Everybody's your fan until, <laughs> until they ain't your fan anymore. But I realize that this is the life that's inside of me. And no matter what happens, no matter where God takes me, I realize that my life is worship. It's worship. Sing it, Jess. It's my worship. And if my God gets more glory out of my pain, if my God gets more glory out of my adversity, if my God's name is exalted when I put on my face that's why I'm alive you've got you've got it all wrong your adversities your heartache your pain it's it's your worship. That's your worship. That's your worship.
worship you're going to give glory to worship you Excuse me.
know I know this may be different. I know I should be preaching right now. But just let the Holy Spirit have his way. Let the grace. Come on, grace. We invite you into this place. Embrace the grace. I'm saying access the grace. God doing for you what you cannot do for yourself. Some of you need that this morning. You, your heart has been heavy this week. You've had a rough couple of days. What you need is for God to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. This is a place of grace. Don't you leave this place without getting what you'll need. what we do right now just 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 walk just be in be in this moment don't you worry about the time just be in this moment just be in this moment I'm praying, I'm saying, God, give me a word. God, give me a word. God, give me a word. Tanya gives a word. And what I just continue to repeat in my head is, no eye, no eyes have seen. No eyes have seen. No ears have heard. Nor has it entered in the heart of man. And this is where it flips. It says, what I'm doing. <laughs> and he says, what I'm doing. 
we see these things that happen in our life and it's just surface stuff we just we see it it's there it's on our phone it's on Facebook it's it's the report and that's what we see but we see things one-dimensional we just see it as that and we begin to draw conclusions of thinking well maybe it means this and maybe it means that and we try to kind of create our own understanding but but we don't but we don't we just see that and that's just what we get but God says but what I'm doing is more than just that you don't see all of the dimensions of that you just see that as what it is but nor I no I has seen no ear has heard no, neither has it entered in the heart of man really what that is and I believe that there has been Boniface Wanbua. He's probably watching right now. He prays for heritage all the time. He prays for you all the time. Prays for me. And he's been reaching out to me every single day, it seems. And listen, I've been, I can't stop praying for you guys. There's a heavy burden on my heart. What, do you, what am I? I'm praying. He keeps on saying, I'm praying for breakthrough. I'm praying for breakthrough. And I believe that same prayer that's on me is on you. Some of you have been wanting a breakthrough in your family. You've been wanting a breakthrough with your children. You've been wanting a breakthrough your finance and you've just been begging God God I need a breakthrough I need a breakthrough and I believe that that breakthrough is coming I believe that it has already been broken through and now you've just got to step into it he, he, every day he's to, to, to this just this morning uh, 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 um, Todd Gardner one of our mentors reached out to me said Brad you're heavy on my heart I'm praying for you Anthony Browswell this morning messaged me Brad you're heavy on my heart what can I pray for you something is happening something is moving there is a shifting in this place and I'm telling you that no eye has seen no ear has heard you've not even begun to contemplate what God is doing behind closed curtains but there's going to come a time when the curtains are pulled back and everything you thought you knew oh I'm telling you everything will be revealed and you're going to be sitting on the top of the mountain looking down and saying at one time I was down there and I thought my life was to the end but I'm telling you I just stayed the course I I just held on to my God and now look where I am today I believe it I believe it the Apostles talked about how they had a great power and the Bible said that they had a great power you know why because of God's great grace and we've been in the middle of our grace series and I'm telling you this has been my prayer. I petitioned God this morning with that piece of paper you gave me. I read it out loud to him. And there's a part that says, so what is your request? And my request is, I want more power. I want more influence. I want a greater reach. I want to expand. I want to do things that I've never seen, never imagined, never even thought of. And I understand that that great power comes from God's great grace. And that grace that I have access to is the grace that you have access to. My God. My God. God, what are you doing in this place today? I just invite you. Just, I just encourage you. Not that you need my permission, but you've got my permission that you will just continue to move in a mighty way. God, I pray that you would give heritage a great power give us a great sound give us a great effectiveness give us great influence give us great change give us great increase oh my gosh great increase god i pray that you will expand us to the left and to the right stretch out your curtains my god says get ready to birth something new god i pray for greatness and i know that your greatness comes on the back of your grace and so god i step into the place of grace this morning i step into your grace i welcome your grace maybe other people don't understand it but it's your grace that will make everything available to me that will enable me that will push me along for me to step into that place that you've been calling me to all of my life my God I thank you for what you've done oh thank you for what you've done my God you may be seated for those who are standing we could try to do this <laughs> musician stay with me just let me help you up you're too pregnant to be doing that what are you doing <laughs> Yeah, we thought she was slain in the spirit. She just said, I'm stuck. <laughs> yeah. Jesse's, man, it's been an hour. Jesse's under the anointing. No, Brad, just somebody help me up. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. My God, my God, my God. Wow, heritage is crazy. 
Y'all crazy. Y'all crazy. Y'all crazy. In Luke chapter 16, verse 11, Jesus made this statement. He said, uh, Jesus made this statement. He said, and may, may, maybe some of you don't want to hear this, but he said, if you're not faithful with the unrighteous mammon, he said, how can you be trusted with true riches? Do you hear that? He, Jesus, the Lord said, if I can't trust you with the unrighteous mammon, mammon is, is money, it's, it's wealth. And the Lord is saying, if I can't trust you with what you have right now, he says, how could I ever, how can I ever trust you with the true riches? And for those of you that think the church shouldn't talk about money, look, listen to what Jesus is saying. I'm telling you. What the enemy wants to do is to silence the pulpit. He wants the pulpit not to say things. And the enemy does not want us talking about money. Why? Because the Lord says, if I can trust you with these resources, this uncommon man, this unrighteous man, if I can trust you with that, then I can trust you with the true riches. Now, the Lord didn't really define what these true riches are, but I believe that it's this unnatural, supernatural, uncommon, it's joy, it's peace, it's glory. I feel like it's more than just money. It's everything that you've been lacking. And so the Lord says, when I can trust you with your unrighteous righteous mammon when I can trust you with your paycheck when I know that you've got that handled then I can let loose of these things I can let loose of the glory I could let loose of the other provisions I can let loose of the joy and the peace and the the, the true riches he says before I send the real stuff I'm gonna watch to see what you do with the fake stuff When you give to heritage, you're giving through heritage. And I have seen how there has been a great anointing because heritage has been trusted with the unrighteous mammon and we have been succeeding. God has been unlocking the true riches in our lives and in this church. And we've been seeing increase and we've been seeing, uh, uh, we've been impacting people and, and we've been seeing a mighty move of the Holy Spirit. Today was a great service. That was an anointing. That was a moving like we, that maybe kind of a little bit unique than what we typically have. And I see that God is doing this. And so this week, I said, I want to do more. I want to do more. I want to go broke giving to others. And so I was like, man, God, what can we do? And, and many of you know, we, we have a friend that goes to another church, Reuben. And he, he served, his Africa is Peru. Like how we are, we have Africa really close to us. Boniface Wambua and Pastor Esther and the orphanage. He does that for Peru. And Heritage, you guys, whether you knew it or not, sent them $250 this week. Why? Because they're in the middle of the COVID-19, and they can't even leave their house to get food. They have no food. They can't go to their pantry like we can go to our pantry. I said, how can we help? He said, they need money. They need food. And so we, that's exactly what we did. Why are we doing that? Because my Lord says, when I, when I can trust you with the unrighteous mammon, then I can give you these true riches. And I want to receive true riches. Amen? Amen? So whether you're here, and many of you already, or whether you're watching right now on, on Facebook, we're going to give you two minutes. So I'll step away for two minutes, kind of compose ourselves. We'll give you two minutes to give your seed. Put your seed into the ground. Be faithful with that unrighteous mammon. And watch my God just begin to unlock the true riches in your life. God, I pray that you will bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name, amen. Log off. Come do what you got to do. We'll be back in two minutes. Todd, you know how to play that? Come on. Come on.
Thank you, Jesus. All righty, all right. My God. You know, thank you, praise team. When we started, when we started um, this, our, our, this contemporary service, back before this even got going, back when SoCog was here, we kind of had a church within the church. Todd was a bass player, but we had Stephen. I wanted to reach out to Stephen to, to be part of this. And so we said, Todd, you want to play the piano? He's like, sure. And Todd just came and fast forward. That was November of 28. No, that was June of 2018. Fast forward two years. There you go, ma'am. My God, my God. Thank you, thank you. My God, thank you, Jesus. We got 40 minutes. Huh? I won't go past. Ashley said, don't go past. I ain't going to go past. You know, I was talking about, this was a, a couple of weeks ago. We are in our Dimensions of Grace series. And, and a couple of weeks ago, and I think it's, is it 2 Corinthians? What is it? What is it? What is it? 2 Chronicles. They were talking about how Israel... And I know that you guys are quiet. I know that we kind of have a, we have a different vibe today. I, it's, it's a very, it's a very, it's, what is this? What is this? It's a different vibe. It's a different anointing. There's something different about today. And I knew it would be. In Second Chronicles, it was talking about how Israel was without a true God. They had a God. It was God. But Israel didn't want a God. They wanted a king. And so they began to live their life without consulting God. Um, there's a lot of people that are suffering today they're in frustration today because you just simply aren't consulting somebody <laughs> you're just you have no mentors in your life you have no counsel in your life you're you're not getting a word from anybody you're just kind of doing the things that you want to do and that's fine because sometimes it works but sometimes you're sitting there left frustrated because why didn't it work out well because you never asked anybody you never consulted god can I tell you something? This is not in my message, but I know that there are times in our lives where t life is challenging, but you shouldn't have to struggle through life all the time. If you are constantly struggling through life and you think, oh, this is just how life is, can I tell you that that's not how life is? That's not how my life is. My life is not perfect. Our life is not perfect. We have challenges just like how you have challenges, but we don't constantly struggle through life. It's not supposed to be that way. Why in the world do we constantly struggle through life when we have an entire book called the Bible that tells you how to access certain things in your life so that your life can be easier? So Israel has a God that says, hey, I want to help you in your life. But the Bible says that they don't have a true God. And the Bible says they are without teaching priests. They have no law. So they have nobody. They have no voices in their life. They have no mentors in their life. They have no one that's trying to hold them accountable. And as a result, the Bible says that there was no peace. There was no turmoil. And the nation was destroyed by nation and the city destroyed by city. If you don't have a true God, if you don't have a teaching priest, if there's no law, if there's no accountability, if you have no mentors, if you have no voices in your life, don't be surprised if you say, well, that's me. I have no peace in my life. Uh, there's always turmoil. We're destroying each other. If that's what's happening in your life, I'll tell you right now, I don't even have to preach my message any, anymore. Let me tell you, if that's you, if you say, I have no peace, there's turmoil, nations are destroying nations, cities are destroying cities, it's because you have left out the true God, you've left out the teaching priest, there's no, there's no government, there's no rule, there's no authority, there's nothing. And that's exactly what's happening to Israel. And so what you need is, is you need a teaching priest. You need someone to teach you the hard stuff and say the hard stuff. And there are a lot of times that I want to say things, um, and maybe while we're out at breakfast or on over the phone or text messaging, that I don't want to say because, you know what, I kind of don't want to maybe come off the wrong way or for, I don't want to you know, run anybody off. But when I stand behind the pulpit, can I, can I just be a teaching priest? Can I say the hard things? Can I speak the truth? Because where there is... Is no where there is no truth, right? Where, where there is where there is people perish, turmoil, no peace, no nothing. And so this morning, I only have a few minutes. I've got I've got to kind of get real for a moment and tell you some things that you probably don't want to hear. And let me just kind of jump ahead and borrow something. It's not there comes. Ugh. When you first get saved, I under I feel like there's a grace period. And you can disagree with me if you want. 
But I feel like there may be a grace period from when you get saved, you come into church, and this is all new, and you're just kind of learning. And so you kind of got one foot in the world and one foot in the church, and you're just trying to kind of balance this out a little bit. But it comes to a point in your life when you've got to make up your mind. Are you getting two foot into the church and in this relationship with your God or two foot into the world? What are you doing? The Bible says that you've got to make up your mind. You've got to either be hot or cold because if you're lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. One translation says you make me vomit. So you got to figure out what you're going, what you're going to do. And I think that's where a lot of people are sometimes. Where you know I'm coming to church, I'm trying to get my life together, but these people are still in my life, and I'm still doing this, and I'm still doing that, and maybe I shouldn't be doing it, but this is what I've done all of my life, and I understand that, and I'm okay with that for a season. I'm okay with that. You're still trying to figure out this whole Jesus guy and this whole new, this relationship. I get that. But it comes a point in time when you've got to either, you know, get, off, get on or get off the track, right? Make up your mind. What are you going to do? And I want to kind of teach that today. There are dimensions of grace, as I've been teaching. There are dimensions of grace. If I have the image, throw it up. If not, it doesn't matter. There are dimensions of grace. There are, there's a grace that saves. There's a grace that forgives. There's a grace that completes. There's a grace that enables. There's a grace that frees. There's a grace that restores. There's all these different dimensions of grace. A lot of times when I was a kid growing up talking about grace, we just kind of always said about it was a grace that saves us and sanctifies us. But there's more to that. And again, I just have a tendency of preaching my message before I preach my message. But there's a lot of truth to the fact that not only that the same grace that we need to save us is the same grace that we need to sustain us. And the same grace that we need to save us is the same grace that we need to save us. The same grace we need to access grace. It's like all of these things that I need, these different dimensions of grace, I just need grace to even access grace. And so when growing up, when we talked about grace, we just thought grace was what was extended to you at the altar when you got saved. But there's so much more to grace. I've been teaching and preaching about how sometimes grace shows up un unwarranted, unexpected. All of a sudden, grace, you met with grace. You know, you should have died in that car accident, but grace showed up. You know, you should have overdosed, but grace showed up. You should have lost that job, but grace showed up. And I'm so thankful for grace. But there are some things that you can do that will unlock grace and what's funny is is sometimes we need grace to even unlock grace there are dimensions to grace and some of these graces show up unexpected and out of nowhere but you can access them because Jesus gave us the keys to access the grace but the fact is and this is where I kind of lean in into my teaching my teaching priest though Jesus gave you the keys but if you don't use them, you're left, to, you're left to your own, and you can only accomplish what you can accomplish on your own. Again, ah, Brad, you do this all the time. God is in charge, but you're in control. What did he say? I'm going to get a backlash for that. God is in charge, but you're in control. Who's got the keys? You have the keys. Jesus says, I give you the keys. God is in charge. God is the boss. He, he, is, he is the creator. He, he's in complete authority. But he says, but I give you the keys. Whatever you bind on earth, I will bind in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, I will loose. So I'm in charge. I've created this opportunity, I'm, uh, but, but you're in control. Heaven responds to earth. And I know that may be contrary to what you've been taught and learned, but I'll give you scriptures backing that up. My boss is in charge. My boss gets the final say-so. My boss creates the opportunity. She's the one that furnished our office. She's the one that opens up our doors. She's the one that kind of creates the opportunity. And she says, now, Brad, here's your desk, and here's your phone, and here's your computer. Here's everything that you need to do your job. Now you're in control. I will sign your check, but you're going to be the one moving my hand. And that's exactly what God is doing. I'm in charge. There's no question about that. He told Adam, he said, Adam, listen, this is the world. I want you to run the earth like I run it in heaven. He said, go out and you have dominion. He said, you go out and run it. I put the keys and, and the authority in your hands. Now you go do this. 
And so we know that we can access grace. We know that we can unlock the uncommon, the unmerited, the unnatural, the supernatural. But those keys are in your hands. And if you're not using them, well, it's on you. And you want to run in prayer and run in frustration and bang on God's door. Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you saving me? Why aren't you delivering me? And he says, because you are the one with the keys. Because you're the one that has control. I will save you. I, 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 can, I can sign that check. I've got the solution. But you're the one. You're the one. You, you. God is in authority, but you're the one that is supposed to be in action. He says, I will open up the floodgates of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you cannot contain when you bring your tithe into the storehouse. That is good. So we, we, I, I got I to gotta get you to understand, I'm going to do this through my message, that you are in, you are in control. You got to understand that there are, there's Jesus the man, there's Jesus the Christ, and then you have Jesus the word. And there, so there's three different forms of Jesus in a sense, and they all three do something different. Jesus the man took your place on the cross. Jesus the man is who shed his blood and was put on to the cross and then buried and then rose from the dead. And now the Bible says that Jesus the man sits in heaven to the right hand of the Father as your intercessor. That's Jesus the man. He is your advocate. He is your lawyer. He pleads your case. If you don't know this, let me teach you something real. When you pray, Romans 8.34 says that when you pray, Jesus sits to the right hand of the Father and he intercedes for you. So when you pray to God, when you pray to Jesus, Jesus turns around and says, God, I'm standing here on behalf of Brad Riddle. My God. My God. I'm standing, hey, 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 I got your attention. Yeah, yeah. So Brad's been praying, and this is what he needs. That's what the Bible says. Jesus sits up in heaven, and he intercedes for you. He goes to the Father for you to plead your case. So that's the Jesus the man. When you accept Jesus the man, when you accept what Jesus did for you, when you, when you acknowledge the fact that he died and he, he was raised from the grave, through by grace through faith you have been freed from your sins you've been delivered and now heaven becomes your home that's what the bible says that if if you believe in your heart and confess with your lips that jesus did die and did rise from the dead and from the grave and now sits in heaven to the right hand of the father you have been saved and when you become saved now your 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 home is now heaven it's, yeah, I understand that you live here, but when, but when you get saved, you become a citizen of heaven. Heaven doesn't become your home when you just die. That's not the only time heaven becomes your home. When you get saved, you become a citizen of heaven, even here on earth. I am a citizen of the greatest nation in the world, the United States of America, whether I'm in Africa or wherever. I'm still a citizen of this great land. And the great thing about that is, is I have advantages as an American citizen, whether I'm here or abroad. You too have that. When you get saved, your home becomes heaven. You become a citizen of heaven. And even though you're on earth, you now have access to heaven things. Paul is talking to the believers in Philippi. And he says, you guys are all citizens of heaven. And because you're citizens of heaven, you have advantages of heaven right here on earth. I think a lot of people want to avoid the church because they go to church and the pastor yells at them for 30 minutes trying to get them to change their life and, and longing for the day that we get to die and go to heaven. But I want to preach a different message. I want you to know that you don't have to wait to die to go to heaven to live heaven-like now, to live heaven-ish, if that even a word, you can experience heaven now. You can experience your blessed life now. My, my Lord says, I've come so that you can have life and have it abundantly, not death abundantly. He says, I want to give you life now. I want you to live the blessed life now. I want you to access heaven now. You don't have to wait until you die. I'm bringing the kingdom, and I give you the keys. Amen. That deserves an amen. That deserves a shout. I'm telling you, you don't have to wait to die to go to heaven to experience it. You can experience heaven now. All these people walking around living in hell. Why? When you can live in heaven. When you can live in heaven. So you have Jesus, the man. He dies for your sin. He gives you access to heaven. Now you have Jesus Christ. Christ isn't Jesus' last name. If anything, it's Nazareth. 
Because in those times, you would often be identified as maybe um, your occupation, uh, Matthew the tax collector, John the Baptist, or you'd be identified by like the town you're from. So he's Jesus of Nazareth. Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ described what was on Jesus. It described his mission. It described his purpose. He was the anointing. He was the anointed one. He was the Messiah. Christ isn't his last name. He said, hey, I'm Jesus Christ. I'm Jesus the anointed I'm Jesus the anointed one and so whenever you're talking about Christ you're talking about the anointing my this is where when you're talking about the anointing you're talking about the influence of God you're talking about the Holy Spirit so Jesus says I'm Jesus Christ that ain't my last name when you hear me identify myself as Jesus Christ I'm saying I'm Jesus the man influenced by my God I'm influenced by the spirit and the power of God I'm influenced by the Holy Spirit I'm Jesus Christ Jesus gets baptized he comes up out of the water the heavens open up and the spirit of God descends on him and then he goes out saying, the Lord is on me and he has anointed me. So whenever you're talking about Christ, you're talking about the anointing. And whenever you're talking about the anointing, you're talking about the Holy Spirit. Let me be a teaching priest and tell you something right now that you're not going to want to hear. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. When you got saved and the Spirit of God now lives inside of you, you are not your own. You are unto Him. So you have got to stop living that way way stop doing those crazy things the bible says that now the holy spirit lives inside of you and if you keep on living the way you've been living i'm just trying to be a teaching priest and be real for a moment you continue to live that way the bible says that you will grieve the holy spirit because now the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Before it wasn't a problem but now it's a problem because you don't want somebody coming up in your house and messing it up the Holy Spirit says, yo, I live in here now. Can you stop doing that? Can you stop watching that? Can you stop smoking that? Can you stop drinking that? Can you stop saying that? Can you stop going there? Can you stop entertaining those people? I live inside of you. Listen, when you get pregnant, your life changes. Your entire life changes. You begin to start doing things you weren't doing. You stop doing things that you were doing. Why? Because now there's a new life inside of you. But yet we get saved. I'm just trying to be a teaching priest. You get saved and you think you can walk out and continue to live the same way. But no, you're not your own anymore. There's a new life inside of you. And if you want just like that baby to grow up and to develop and birth something and be healthy, if you want the Holy Spirit to birth something inside of you, you've got to stop living that way. Amen. Amen. I know you don't want to hear it because I know you want the gospel to be preached in a way that you can continue to live the way you've been living and everything's okay. And I got to tell you something that you can't do that. Brad, you don't normally preach that way. You don't really say that thing. I just, I'm trying to get you. Can I hop? Let me hop to the end of my message. By the time I'm done, I'm going to tell you how you can redeem your time. I'm talking, you, but you sitting in here and say, I've lost time, I lost memories, I've lost holidays, I've lost finances. You want to redeem that? I'm telling you how, so just hang on. Uh, just hang on. Gotta stop acting crazy. So now you have Jesus the Word, you got Jesus the man, he dies for your sin, you have Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, now you have Jesus the Word. You have got to understand that Jesus the man, this is so good, Jesus, you ever said, I mean, <laughs> Never mind. Uh, you have to understand that Jesus the man is what brings me to heaven, but Jesus the word is what brings heaven to me. You ever hear something so good and, and you just want to say things like, you know, anyway. Oh, that's good. That's good. You know, I mean, sometimes there's only certain adequate words like, man, that's, that's good. Jesus the man is what brings me to heaven, but Jesus the word is what brings heaven to me. That is good. Because the commands of Jesus unlock heaven, bringing heaven alongside of me. And there, you talk about the dimensions of grace. There's two dimensions of grace right there. What Jesus did, that part of Jesus gets me to heaven, but what Jesus said brings heaven to me. 
What's unfortunate, though, is that you, you can't meet Jesus, the man. I guess you can. Here's what's fortunate. You can, you can meet Jesus, the man, and still not know Jesus, the word. Oh, that's, wor- that's right. That's right. That, that was two rights. That deserves a church full of rights. You can meet Jesus, the man, and still not know Jesus, the word. That's right. That's right. And I believe that that's where most Christians are today. They live in this constant state of frustration because they know the man, but they don't know what he said. My God. And so, and so because of that, they don't know what he said, and, and they don't know the keys, and they, they don't know the principles, and they're always questioning God as to why certain things are not happening in their life. They think, hey, if I know you, isn't that good enough? He says, no, you know Jesus the man, but you don't know Jesus the word. You don't know what I've said. You don't know what I've taught you. You don't know, you don't know the kingdom keys. And because of that, you're wondering why God's not moving for you, because you don't know the word. You don't know what I said. Jesus the man brings us to heaven. Jesus the word brings heaven to us. But if you don't know what I said, when you pray, sometimes if you struggle to pray, I don't even know what to say. When you pray, you looking at me? When you pray, you can open up your phone, open up your Bible, and you need to quote back to God what he said. Because, my God, because Jesus the word... (laughs) It's time you know the word. And you can say your word says this. And because your word says this, I demand that as a child of God. It is, I get to inherit that. I'm a citizen of heaven. The Constitution says this. And as a citizen of the United States of America, I want this. But if you don't know the word, you can't say that. Your prayer time should be you repeating back to God what he said about you. My God, my God, my God. Mm, that's good. So last week, you coming up? Come up, we'll keep it chill for a little bit. But I want you to come up. I want you to give me some background music. Huh? Yeah. Listen to this. I just, I just want that background. You know, that, mm, I just want that for a second. That's my countdown. When he comes up, I know I have to wrap it up. Last week, we lean lean into this restoration thing. We learned that the man with the withered hand, his hand wasn't healed. It was what? Thank you. I'll say that again for the people in the back. It was restored. To restore means to reconstruct, to rebuild, to create a new structure. You have got to get that in you. Restoration ah, isn't the returning to an old thing. It's the creating of a new thing. Oh, my God. He said, I, he said, come, I want to restore your hand. I don't want to take you back to where you were. I want to create something new. If you're a car guy, it's called a frame-off restoration. It's when they don't go in and just kind of fix what you have. They take you down to the nuts and bolts. They take you down, and they start all over, and they build not an old thing. They build something completely new. It looks old because it's an older car, but no, man, that's as good, that's as, good as a 2020. It's a restoration. It's a reconstruction. It's the rebuilding of something new. It's not the returning to an old. It's the creating of a new thing. When Ashley and I, when God restored our marriage, I I, I preached on this last week. God could not return us back to our old marriage because it was faulty. Because, and I'll just tell you, because when Ashley and I got married, we had no voices in our life. We did not have a marriage counselor. I don't know if I got any, before you get married, go talk to a marriage counselor. Have a mentor. Even if it's not a counselor, go find a marriage couple that you admire and say, hey, how are you doing marriage? Because we did not do that. I began to lead my wife and lead my family by, my, by watching my mom and dad, which is nothing wrong with that. But my mom and dad's marriage is not the marriage that I actually wanted. It's the, it's the truth. What worked for my mom and dad is not going to work for me and Ashley. And so when we built our marriage, it was faulty. And so when God restored our marriage, God could not take us back to the beginning or to, back to the old ways because it was faulty. Every, we, we had to strip our marriage down and create something completely new. And we needed to create it in such a way, hear me this morning, that the enemy who stole it from us last time, Ephesians says, let him steal no more. 
So the reason why you can't just heal what you had and you have to restore it is because you have to recre recreate and restructure and rebuild it all over again so that the enemy that got into your door the last time, he don't come in again. That's good. The enemy keeps on coming into your back door all the time. And you think you're doing good enough by just going over there and just kind of shutting it and locking it. Knowing, knowing good and well he's going to come back through again. That's not working for you. I'm going to quit smoking. And so I'm going to buy a pack, but I'm just not going to carry it around with me. Okay, well, all you've created is the fact that now you go to the kitchen cupboard more now than you ever have. I mean, you know. I mean, listen, I've been there. There's been things I've had to overcome, and you kind of set these parameters. You know what I'm going to do? I'm only going to do that on Friday nights, <laughs> you know? But you're not, you're, you're not, re you're not, re you're not, you're not building something new. You're, you're not creating a new thing. And, 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 and until you do, you're, you're always going to be visited by that over and over again. In other words, you need to do something in your life this time that will not let him do what he did last time. It's good. So let me talk about that. I got 15 minutes. Let me talk about what you need to do. I'm telling you, by the end of my message, I'm going to talk about here's how you redeem your time. Here's how you get back what you've lost. I'm talking about the dimensions of grace. Grace is God doing for you what you cannot do for you. I'm preaching today. I know it's not fire and gusto. There's a different anointing. There's, this is a different atmosphere. I believe I got your attention now more than when I, when I hoot and holler. I don't even know what, what I even got going on Facebook. I, I hope you're with me right now. There are dimensions of grace. Grace is when God does for you what you cannot do for yourself. And many of you have just lost out. You have been robbed from from. You've been taken advantage from. Your name has been evil spoken of. And you just want to be redeemed. You want to be bought back. You want to be avenged. And I'm telling you how you get that back. Ephesians 5. Back you with me. Ephesians 5. Sean, that's perfect. Therefore, be imitators of God. I'll stop right there. <laughs> not imitators of your peers. Not imitators of Hollywood weird. You know, not imitators of what's happening on social media. He says, be imitators of God. And walk in love as Christ has loved us and given himself for us. It's an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. Our God is a smelly God. He loves smells. The Bible talks about it. Your worship, your praise, it, smell, it smells good. Before I even knew that, I often talked about the sweetness of, of the anointing. I talked about there is a there is a sweetness. And I never knew that. This was when I was a kid, when I was younger, growing up and being a youth pastor and still exploring the Bible. And then one day I discovered, oh my, oh my gosh. God, there, there, he is a smelly God. I just, there, there, I could, there's something unique about what's happening. And that's what he says. Sweet smelling aroma. But listen to verse 3. This is the part you don't want. This is the teaching priest. But fornication and all cleanness, uncleanness, or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as it is fitting for saints. He didn't just say not do it. He said, don't let your name be brought up in it. He said, don't, 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 fornication, uncleanness, don't, no, 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 don't go out and do it. He didn't even say that. He said, don't, you, don't your name even be brought up in that. Don't, when people are talking about clubbing, they shouldn't even, you shouldn't even be an option of who they could text to go out with you. I know you don't want me to preach this because this goes against what you want, but I'm trying to tell you how you get to redeem time. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to be a teaching priest. Some of you have no peace. You, you're living in turmoil, and you're sitting there frustrated. I'm trying to help you. What can help you unfrustrate your life? And he said, listen, don't you, don't, don't, even, not, not just not do it. He said, don't even let your name be brought up in it. Verse 4. Neither filthiness, no foolish talk, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather give thanks. He said, your mouth ain't meant for filth. 
He said, he said, it's meant for praise. My God, I got that's a little Holy Spirit bump right there. That's what that was. He said, your hands are not meant for filth. They're meant for praise. He said, your jump ain't meant for filth. It's meant for praise. The psalmist said, I will bless the Lord at all times, and this praise shall continually be in my mouth. Don't you curse them and then praise God with that same tongue? I'm just, I'm just saying. I understand that there's this grace period when you're trying to get things figured out. That's why heritage is a place of grace. And everybody is welcome. And there is absolutely no judging. Ashley and I, what we, we are blessed and we're fortunate that you guys are real around us. You don't sugarcoat. We, and we love that about you guys. This is a real church full of real people with real stories who serves a real God that really loves us. I understand that. And never change that. Be real with us. Say the funny things that you're saying with us. And it's fun because we, we want to be, relate with you. But I want you to know that eventually I'm trying to pull you out of that. Because I want to help you redeem what you've lost. Verse 5. For this you know. Is this good, is this good preaching? Oh my, it is, it's good. Oh, I'm going to cry. <laughs> What's wrong with me? I'm just, I'm pregnant. <laughs> I believe I'm birthing something new. I'll tell you that right now. I believe, I, be, I believe I'm birthing something new. Aaron, you're a man's man. I'm some man's man. I don't know, man. I, you know, I'm crying sitting at breakfast with Aaron. You, you crying, Brad? No. Oh boy. That guy cries all the time. What's wrong with him? I don't know. That's why God's given heritage a great. You gotta, we have a lot of strong men here. I feel safe with you guys here. And God's like, uh, send Brad some men. <laughs> he needs a little bit of it. <laughs> Verse 5. For this you know. I'm sorry. Let me, I'm sorry to say this. No fornicator, no unclean person, no, nor covetous man who is an idolater, can I read this, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. I'm sorry, but the pulpit can't be silent. I'm trying to help you redeem what you've lost. The kingdom of God is the rule of God. It's the advantages. It's the influence of God. And Paul said that the fornicators, the unclean people, the covetous man, the idolater, the people that live this lifestyle, you have no rights to this kingdom. It shocks me when I watch your Facebook post about how you're doing this and doing that and living this wild life. But then the very next post, you're giving praise and glory to God and asking Him to move on your behalf. But my Bible tells me that no fornicator, no unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater can have any inheritance of the kingdom of Christ and God. You have no rights. You have no rights. I got to go back and repeat something because I don't want you to misunderstand me. Sometimes you meet grace when you don't deserve it. You are a fornicator. You are unclean. You do covet. You do not deserve to access the kingdom. But my grace is sufficient. You do not deserve it. I'm going to meet you at the altar. I'm going to save your life. You've been saved by grace. You've been saved by grace. You've been saved by grace. You've been saved. Rick, you've been saved by grace. Chuck, you've been saved by grace. You guys, you guys get it. You understand that. I'm not, I'm not forgetting about that. But if you constantly live your life thumbing your nose at God, why in the world can you expect to inherit the kingdom? The kingdom is my inheritance as a saint. First Corinthians says, the kingdom belongs to those who have been washed.